Hi, my name's Phil. I like talking about politics. In fact, so much so that so for the next few days there may actually be multiple. There's probably going to be two videos today because I want to talk about um, the the votes today, uh, but not just in a speculative way. Because what I really want to talk about is the Attorney General's legal advice on the agreements that we were told about in the government statement last night. So basically, picking off from where I left it last night, there's. There was widespread reporting in newspapers today that Theresa May has secured her legally binding changes to the backstop. That now means that a large proportion of this country think two things. One, that the backstop agreement is not what it was. Now, many don't know what the backstop agreement ever was, other than that their newspaper said it was really bad, right? But they now think that it has changed from what it was, which is really bad, to what it is now, which may be quite good, even though not a single word of it has changed. Secondly, they think, oh, the EU has cracked at the last moment because the EU said there would be no changes to the backstop. Brexiteers said that the EU would crack at the last minute. Now their newspapers are telling them that the backstop has changed. So they now believe that the that the backstop has been nullified and that the EU, oh, actually, look, the Brexiteers were right. They do back down at the last second. That is really dangerous. It's a really dangerous ploy of the Prime Minister, yet again showing that she's willing to deceive the public just to ensure her political aims. And particularly du duplicitous of newspapers, of course, who've gone along with it. They ought to really look really stupid now because even the Attorney General, a member of Theresa May's own cabinet, has had to concede that there are no changes to the withdrawal agreement at all. You know, whether to the backstop or anything else. But more about that in a few minutes. So, the backstop hasn't changed. I said that last night. And, but that was only based on not reading anything. That was based on the uh, statement from the government. I've now read things. Um, it still does what it did before. And to leave it, we'll still need the same conditions. Um, the so-called change, all it actually does is set out the legal procedure in the event of a disagreement between the UK and the EU. But even that isn't anything new because it's an established legal procedure for dealing with disputes between two nations anyway. Then the government presented a fourth document which states that the UK has, they see no problem at all. Let's say, so let's say we get this deal through and we're getting towards the end of the transition period and we still haven't come to agreement. The, this fourth document says that the UK interprets the legal situation that we could just walk away and the backstop wouldn't come into force. You know, we could just walk away from the whole thing. Uh, in other words, even if the deal is supported, we could still, still end up with a no-deal Brexit. That would have been crucial in terms of getting the ERG on board. But does it hold any legal weight? No. Um, so naturally, of course, the EU did not agree to that fourth document. It is therefore just Theresa May's uneducated opinion on a matter of international law, for which the even more qualified Attorney General is not all that familiar with. Um, so in terms of MPs having the confidence to swing their support behind the deal, a lot depended on what the Attorney General, Geoffrey Cox, had to say. Now, you don't need to be legally trained, even though he isn't on EU and international law, but he's far more trained than I am, of course. Uh, he is an expert on law to see that it didn't change anything about the backstop. For example, this was a really crucial thing last night in what they were saying. The government kept saying that there has been a legally binding change to the backstop. But they also acknowledged that the original agreement has not been changed, but it's simply been added to by a document that, as they said, has the same legal power. But it contradicts it. Or at least what they say this document contained contradicts it. You can't have two contradictory documents with equal legal weighting. Remember, this is the reason why the referendum could never be binding, because it contradicts the will of Parliament. One of them has to take precedence, the will of Parliament. So that meant one of two things. Either one, the new document doesn't have the same legal weighting, or two, the new document doesn't contradict it because it doesn't actually change the backstop. Little clue, it's the second one of those two. Dominic Grieve, himself a former Attorney General, he said that there's no legal change to the backstop in this at all. But for MPs to vote on it when they didn't before, they needed a legal advisor to publicly say that it was now all different, it's all fine now, don't worry about it. 
Now, there were, earlier on, before his advice came out, reports suggesting that Jeffrey Cox was not playing ball on this. Because, obviously, Theresa May wants him to say, yeah, it's totally different now. Um, and he wasn't doing. Just like Dominic Grieve has said, no, it doesn't change anything. So the Prime Minister allegedly told him to go away and reconsider before he actually publishes his advice. A reason for this. So, for example, David Davis, one of the arch Brexiteers, he said that he might vote for the deal if the Attorney General said it had legal force. Well, it undoubtedly has legal force, but to not let the UK walk away from the backstop, it, it doesn't make it easier for us to do that. If anything, it makes it harder because it lays down the process. So for us to walk away from the backstop, not only would we have to put in a solution in place, but if the EU weren't satisfied with it, we'd have to go to a court somewhere, not a British court, may even be a European court, but it certainly would not be a British court that would decide it. It would be a, potentially an international court. And remember, we no longer have representation on the international court. Um, so, it, but in terms of what David Davis was saying, it's a classic example of what a lot of Conservative MPs are looking for, which is a chance to vote on it, but if it didn't turn out how you know they're saying to their constituents it is, they get to blame the Attorney General for leading them astray. So it's just another blame game in this Brexit of blame. Then Jacob Rees-Mogg also said that the legal advice would be important, but he described it as a political decision. In other words, leaving himself open to vote against it no matter what. And remember what I've been saying, the ERG, even though they say they want a deal, they're going to vote against any deal because they want no deal. And in fact, since the ERG have now officially said that they are not going to vote for this deal. So his advice was published just before noon, Geoffrey Cox's, the Attorney General's. In it, he said that it reduces the risk of being held in the backstop indefinitely. Now, personally, I would say even that was a lie. But let's be generous. Is he saying that we won't be stuck in the backstop forever? No. He's just saying that it's less likely, in his words. Is he saying that the UK could unilaterally end the backstop? No. Now, given that those were the two issues that Conservative MPs said they had with the backstop, do these two documents do anything to address that in his legal opinion? No, they don't. In fact, in one part of his legal advice, he even seems to suggest that the document in question is simply a reflection of accepted international legal practice. That's what I thought yesterday. It doesn't add anything to anything. He just says that it puts the agreements already made back in January. He's also referring to letters sent by Donald Tusk and, and, and Juncker as well to, um, to Theresa May, where they'd already agreed to this. So in terms of what Theresa May has been negotiating, it just proves that it's a farce because what she's come out with is what she was already offered two months ago. Um, and that's in the Attorney General's own advice. The Prime Minister's own legal lapdog has written this in the advice. So it dispels the notion she's done any negotiating in the past few weeks. Um, he also notes that the EU accepts a role in trying to find a solution to the Irish border problem in order to avoid a backstop. So it's not just down to the UK. He also notes that he believes the document represents new legal obligations. Now, that may or may not be true. I'll be honest, I wasn't aware of previous documents that made the EU responsible, even partly responsible, for coming up with solutions to those border issues. Uh, as far as I knew, it would be entirely down to the UK. That being said, the key point is that he's saying there is no change to the backstop itself, either the mechanism for it, in other words, how it works, nor the conditions for starting it or ending it. Now, regarding the unilateral document, this is the one where, you know, the government has said, in our opinion, if we, at the end of the transition period, can't come to an arrangement with the EU, we can just walk away from all aspects of it, including the backstop. So what he said regarding that was, he notes that it hasn't been agreed on upon with the EU. He said it does have legal status as an interpretive document, but it's an interpretation on the part of someone that isn't a judge and not presiding over a case. So it's not a fact of law. So it's all pointless. I mean, can you imagine our argument in court? So let's say we think we should leave the backstop. The EU are going, no, you haven't solved the border issue. We go to this International Court of Arbitration and our case is, look, we have this letter signed by Theresa May 
saying that in her opinion, we can just leave. I can't imagine judges would spend very long really considering that document. But he says, well, we could lodge it, you know, with an international court. Well, oh, okay, fine. You, you could lodge, you know, yesterday's, you know, used dinner plates if you want. I don't think it really helps. So anyway, Jeffrey Cox himself also didn't seem to make himself available to answer questions of the House. As far as I can tell, obviously proceedings are still going on and I may have missed something on the way home from work. Um, but it certainly suggested yesterday that he would not be presenting himself for questions by Parliament. Now, not answering questions in the House would be an indication that this statement he's made is not intended for close scrutiny because it would get scrutiny if he was to have to answer questions on it. And of course, he can't lie. Lying to Parliament is a very serious matter. Um, you know, and, and of course, that leaves him open to having to tell the truth, even if he'd be trying to be evasive about it. And there'd be plenty of, well, certainly opposition MPs, but even some of his own backbenchers that would be asking some very awkward questions. You know, and therefore he'd have to be arguing against his boss's position. So they've essentially meant, said, here's, here's his legal advice. It's in published form. And to be fair, they published it three hours before they absolutely had to. You know, it's not a long document. It wouldn't exactly take a lot of picking over. Um, so they've decided he's not going to answer questions. So in terms of whether or not this deal would ever have a chance of going through in a few hours time, we'll look at the different factions. So one, you've got the Conservative MPs who tow the party line or are at least loyal to the Prime Minister for whatever reason. They voted for it before. They will vote for it again. So there weren't that many of them, of course. Two, there are Conservative MPs who don't want to be seen by their constituents as voting for something that locks us into the EU system. Now, if they can look like they're voting for something that doesn't do that, they sort of want to tow the party line. They don't want to rebel against their own party. They would be eager for that. Now that newspapers have backed May's deception, or at least the early edition, you notice the later editions have changed their tune, um, they may feel confident voting for it. So there, there will certainly be more MPs voting in favour of it if they feel it can be safe to be done so. The ERG and others wanting a no-deal Brexit, um, they were never going to vote for any deal. They have now officially said that they will not. It made no difference what she came back with. They were never going to vote it through. So that's pretty much sunk it. But we'll look at the other ones because now at this point, she needs opposition support. Now, I'm not going to say that every ERG MP won't vote for it. Some may abstain, some may actually vote for it. As long as they're certain, it won't go through. They absolutely don't want it to go through. Some of them may vote for it, I suppose, um, on the basis of they're okay supporting a losing cause. No point in rebelling against your government for no good reason. But at the same time, because the ERG have officially said they won't support it, it could well be that all of those ERG MPs won't support it, in which case she needs a lot of opposition support. So she'll get a little bit of support from the few Labour MPs who do want Brexit and are willing to defy the leadership. There were a very small number that did this last time. There may be a small number that do so this time. It might even be increased slightly. Uh, I wouldn't have thought it was increased much. Labour in general have already said they'll vote against it. Um, it their argument is... Nothing has changed about the agreement, which is true. But even if it had, it doesn't include anything that they have said they require of a withdrawal agreement. So they're perfectly in their rights to vote against it. And of course, as we know, the majority of Labour, if not the leadership, don't want Brexit anyway. So of course they're going to vote against it. The Liberal Democrats, the SNP and the Green Party would, of course, not vote for it because they are all openly in favour of cancelling Brexit. Um, the DUP have already said that they would be against it. And of course they would because they know that nothing has changed. The reality is it does lock Northern Ireland into EU customs union. And in actual fact, it gives the UK the option of taking Great Britain out of that customs union, but keeping Northern Ireland in it. Um, and then Plaid and Independence were largely against it, but arguments for that vary. So... In actual fact, there are no numbers for it. It's, it's almost not even speculation at this point, given that the ERG have said they are definitely not going to support it. There are not going to be the numbers. The best Theresa May can hope for is that it doesn't get beaten as badly as it did last time. And I think that, you know, it will be a bit of a swing. 
Um, it can't surely even be a big enough swing to make her think it's worth going for it a third time with a little extension either. But that's the situation we have right now. The Attorney General has basically said, yeah, there's no real change. The only change he alluded to was the legal framework for pursuing a grievance in the case of a disagreement on what is the same mechanism. But even in that, he does also say, but that's the normal procedure anyway for a dispute in international law. So there you go. He doesn't even say in his thing, that, or unless I've missed it, I'll read it again a couple of times, but I, I'm pretty sure I didn't even see him say that it would be an international court, not the European courts that would have jurisdiction. But that may be true. I don't know that. It may be that he doesn't know that. Remember, he is not an expert in EU and international law. He is probably as much of an expert as anyone on the government benches. Um, there are several QCs, but not necessarily one's expert in international law. But, you know, they have their specialisms just like everyone else. So hopefully that will explain that bit. There'll be another bit coming, of course, after the vote. Uh, whether it's long or short, I don't know. It might be interesting to see the breakdown of the votes. And then tomorrow we can look forward to the no deal Brexit as well. So I hope you found the video interesting. If you did, don't forget to click the like button, subscribe for further content and click the bell notification as well. Until next time, I'll see you later.